Earlier, we were talking about Charles Wesley's evangelical conversion. And so now we are ready uh, to finally talk about uh, John Wesley's own evangelical conversion. And for those of you who are not Methodists, when you hear this expression, Aldersgate experience, okay, you might not know what that means if you're not a Methodist, Aldersgate experience, that refers to John Wesley's conversion, watch how I'm defining it, to the proper Christian faith, to real, true, proper, scriptural Christianity, okay? Um, and so I wanted to define that, that term for you, uh, the Aldersgate experience. And that's what we're going to explore right now. Uh, and we'll do it by looking in many instances at Wesley's own words. And so, on the date, someone asked about dates the other day. What dates do you need to know? Here's one. Here's a date for you. Uh, May 24th, 1738. You should know that date. Uh, that was the date of John Wesley's conversion to the proper Christian faith. Uh, and so John Wesley, like his brother Charles, uh, also realized the fruits of saving faith. In fact, so significant was the realization of grace for Wesley at this time that he placed a narrative insert, a narrative insert in his journal, in his journal. What is a narrative insert? What am I referring to here? Well, actually, it's a literary construction. Uh, uh, in other words, it's 10 pages. It's long. It's 10 pages long. We're on this date, on May 24th, 1738, Wesley is reviewing He's reviewing and, in a sense, summarizing his entire spiritual journey up until this point. So that's what I mean by a narrative insert. Now, let me just tell you, let, me, let you know, that in broader Methodism, there are some people who like to discount or reduce or even reject the significance of John Wesley's Aldersgate experience. They do that. They do it even today. However, the objective evidence, yes, the hard evidence, the primary sources, even in terms of literary structure, even in terms of literary structure, shows the cruciality of this experience. For example, if you were to give the copy of Wesley's journal to someone who is a professor of English at some university and ask them, what does this indicate, this narrative insert? They will tell you, even if they know nothing about religion, they will tell you that it suggests cruciality, that this is a very important date. But there are much more evidences than this that we can bring to bear to show that something important happened on May 24th, 1738. And once again, you know, I try to be a careful scholar here. I always run with the evidence, not what people are saying about the evidence, because that uh, is not always a good window on Wesley's life and thought. Uh, sometimes it's confused, sometimes they're unwilling to look at all the evidence. They only want certain parts that favor their distorted view. Uh, we can have none of that here, none of that here. Uh, we must speak truth to one another and speak the truth in love, okay? Uh, and the facts, the very facts, the very details, the objective details of the primary sources will paint a picture. And it's an important picture to be sure. So Wesley appends this narrative insert uh, to his journal account, lengthy, 10 pages long, reviewing his whole spiritual journey uh, up until this point. Um, and then uh, there is also this misunderstanding at Wesley studies, in Wesley studies. Again, it's, it's distortion, confusion, misunderstanding. They say, oh, 
Oh, John Wesley, after Aldersgate, May 24th, never referred to this experience again. False. False. Because we have the hard evidence, again, in the primary sources, that Wesley did indeed specifically refer back to May 24th, uh, 1738. Uh, he did so uh, in the fall, we'll talk about this in a few moments, in a letter to his brother, Sam Jr. So from May to the fall, in the fall, Wesley refers back to May 24th, 1738, in a letter to his brother. But then, but then um, he talks about this uh, much, much later, much later on, much later on. Uh, in December of 1745, in December of 1745, in a letter to John Smith. So I ask you, do you know, what's today's date? Today is the October 18th. Do you know what you did on October 18th, uh, seven years ago? Do you know? No. Suppose you did. If you did, it must be an important date, right? If you did know. And so that's precisely the point. Once again, the hard evidence, this, this is the primary sources. Wesley writes a letter to quote, quote, John Smith, perhaps, uh, perhaps Bishop Secker, uh, and he indicates quite clearly on December 30th, 1745, years after this event took place, uh, he refers to it cl quite clearly and the crucial nature of this event, okay? Um, so, in this narrative insert, in this spiritual summary uh, that Wesley writes, he points out, among other things, that while he was in Georgia, he was beating the air. He was ignorant, ignorant of the righteousness which comes from Christ, with the result that he sought to establish his own righteousness or justification under the law. In this state, Wesley continued, I was indeed fighting continually, but not conquering. And so in this path that Wesley's describing, which was marked by repeated spiritual defeat by the continual dominance of sin in his life, um, Wesley remained. And here, I give you Wesley's own words as he's describing his Georgia experience. He, quote, fell and rose and fell again, <clears throat> end of quote. That's how Wesley's describing, describing his Georgia uh, account. Wesley, of course, intuitively understood that such a condition, you know, this rising and falling again repeatedly, is not the proper Christian faith. It is not. It is not what scriptural Christianity has to offer to believers. It offers much more than that. Now, Wesley, of course, could have shut down this whole conversation. He could have said, of course I'm a Christian. I was baptized in the Anglican church. I was raised in a godly home. Uh, I went to Oxford University. I gave lectures on the love of God. I was ordained deacon. I was ordained a priest. I was a missionary to Georgia. And all of that does not make a Christian. Yes, it doesn't make a Christian. What makes a Christian is the simple reception by grace through faith alone in Jesus Christ, okay? And so this is at the heart of Wesley's story here. He desired uh, to have the proper Christian faith. He could have, you know, abandoned that journey, said, oh, I'm good enough, good enough. Uh, I don't have to go further. I don't have to go through all the struggle, this pain, this suffering. Uh, I don't have to go through any of it. But he didn't. And, and it's good that he didn't. So in light of these changes, which are about to take place here, some more telling than others, uh, when Peter Berla came along uh, proclaiming 
what John and Charles Wesley at first called a new gospel, announcing deliverance to the captives, nothing less than freedom from the power and dominion of sin. Wesley eagerly embraced such a message. Uh, and it was only then that he began to realize the two fruits that are inseparably connected to saving faith. Uh, and that is uh, dominion over sin and a constant peace from a sense of forgiveness. And so Wesley wanted nothing less than a living faith in Jesus Christ. Um, he wanted a living faith, which was, to use his own words, quote, inseparable from a sense of pardon for all past and freedom from all present sins. And so um, 20th century biographers, and even now into the 21st century, uh, when they do acknowledge that Aldersgate was actually something, they simply say that Aldersgate was the time of John Wesley's assurance, when he was assured that he was a child of God. In other words, when he received the witness of the Holy Spirit to his spirit, that he was a child of God. Now, no one is doubting that assurance is very much a part of what Aldersgate is. But I am going to argue, and I think I can argue convincingly, once again, in light of the hard evidence, primary sources, Wesley's own words, that much more happened at Aldersgate than simply assurance. Because if, if assurance is all that happened at Aldersgate, that means that John Wesley was what in Georgia? It means he was justified and born of God. It means he was justified and born of God, and he's simply lacking the witness of the Spirit uh, to, to that, okay? And that's what some argue. There are many who argue that. My reply to you, if you argue that, if, if Wesley was justified and born of God, while in Georgia, if that is what constitutes real, true, proper, scriptural Christianity, heaven help us, heaven help us, really, because that is not a, a life to be desired, this rising and falling, rising only to fall again, that kind of ongoing slavery and bondage. As I said earlier, Christ died for more than to leave people in the bondages of which they are ashamed, okay? And, and Wesley understood that. He wanted that kind of grace in his life, that kind of faith that sets the captive free. Jesus Christ, in other words, this is a way of glorifying Christ. Jesus Christ is a real redeemer. Not a phony redeemer, not a redeemer who leaves the people in slavery, in bondage, this sort of thing. Okay? So, uh, in his narrative insert, uh, Wesley relates that in the days just prior to May 24th, 1738, his spirit was marked, quote, by strange indifference, dullness, and coldness and unusually frequent relapses into sin, end of quote. And so the contrast then, which, which was to follow shortly, by means of Wesley's own Aldersgate narrative, is, is something that is drawn by John Wesley himself, because he's, he's showing you the contrast here. He's showing you the contrast here. Okay, now I am actually going to just simply cite Wesley's own words, his own words, primary evidence, uh, objective evidence that we can look at and assess theologically to come to understanding in terms of John Wesley's Aldersgate experience. So I'll give you his own words. 
then I'm going to come back at you and ask you some questions about it and see if you understand all that is here in this paragraph that I'm going to read to you now. So, quote, in the evening I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street where one was reading Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans. About a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Those are Wesley's own words. He is describing what was taking place there in this society meeting on May 24th, 1738. What I just read you is rich theologically. I want to pick it apart right now and show you what is here theologically. Um, first of all, we'll just state the obvious. Yes, assurance is here. There's no doubt because look at the language. An assurance was given me. So Wesley is specifically referring to assurance here. An assurance was given me. No one's doubting that. No one's doubting that. This is the time when John Wesley receives the direct witness of the Holy Spirit to his spirit that he is a child of God, and, you know, as Paul talked about in Romans chapter 8. Okay? But is that the only thing that's here theologically? Is that the only thing that's here theologically? The answer is no. No. What else is here? Ah, what else is here? Let me, let me cite the language here. Uh, that he, and who is he? He is Christ here. He had taken away my sins, even mine. What's that language descri describing? What is that language describing? That he had taken away my sins, even mine. That is the language, the language of justification. That is the language of the reception of the forgiveness of sins. Remember that dialogue in Georgia between Spangenberg and John Wesley? And he, Spangenberg asked Wesley about Jesus Christ and, and asked, them specific, asked him specifically, do you know Christ? And he said, I know that he is the savior of the world. He responded generally. Look what he's doing here. He's saying, uh, and he has taken away my sins, even, even mine. Uh, that is the language of justification. That is the language of the forgiveness of sins. If you fail to recognize it, you are missing something that is in the text. Okay, you're missing something that is clearly in this text. It is the language of justification and the forgiveness of sins. But then there's, that, there's something else here as well. Not simply assurance, not simply justification, but also the new birth. The language of regeneration. How so? Because after Wesley writes that uh, he had taken away my sins, even mine. Then he continues and states, and saved me from the law of sin and death. He saved me from the law of sin and death. Okay. What is that language describing? Well, it's describing regeneration, the new birth. Uh, freedom from the power and the dominion of sin, which is a mark of the new birth, okay? So, what then do we have here in the Aldersgate narrative? 
We have not won things. See, that's the most common view in Wesley's studies today. They say, oh yeah, this is just about assurance. Oh, of course Wesley was justified and born of God before all this gate. Of course he was. Well, the of courseness drops out, and it drops out because of Wesley's own long and belabored narrative, whereby he is struggling with being a real Christian, and he tells us so. Okay? And we see here in this Aldersgate narrative three things, not just one, but three things. We see justification, the forgiveness of sins. We see regeneration, empowerment, freedom from the power, dominion of sin. We see assurance, uh, the direct witness of the Holy Spirit with our spirits that we are a child of God. You take those three together, those three together, put them together, what do we call that? We call that conversion. We call that conversion or evangelical conversion, whatever. And so we have the three things here, okay? Listen to Wesley's language once more, the language of Aldersgate. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. So, observe once again that Wesley's own Aldersgate narrative does not simply highlight assurance, but sees it in conjunction with the liberty of having been redeemed from the law of sin and death. As a matter of fact, in the days immediately following his Aldersgate experience, Wesley, while not neglecting the importance of assurance, underscored the theme of spiritual victory. The theme of spiritual victory in a way that he had not done before. He, he writes, quote, and herein I found the difference uh, between this and my former state chiefly consisted. I was striving, yea, fighting with all my might under the law as well as under grace. But then I was sometimes, if not often, conquered. Now I was always conqueror. And, and then on May 25th, the following day, Wesley writes, but this I know, I have now peace with God, I sin not today. And on May 29th, a few days later, uh, Wesley, Wesley professed, quote, I have constant peace, not one uneasy thought, and I have freedom from sin, not one unholy desire. Okay. Now, let me just say something briefly here in this context, although We'll talk about it later on in the course. Um, uh, though many good things happened here at the Aldersgate experience, uh, all was not well. And so Wesley made some changes, some changes in his theology later on, especially in terms of the issue of assurance. And then secondly, how he understood the parsing out of sin, uh, in other words, freedom from the guilt of sin, in justification, freedom from the power of sin, in terms of regeneration, and freedom from the being of sin. See, we haven't <coughs> talked much about that. Freedom from the being of sin, or the carnal nature, or inbred sin, we can use those terms synonymously. That would be a third kind of liberty. And it's going to take Wesley a little time to sort that out very clearly theologically. And so we're not trying to offer the impression that, you know, all is well with Aldersgate because Wesley is going to have to, he still has some theological confusions that are in place, some of them mediated to him by the Moravians. And he's going to have to sort that out, uh, and he will. It'll take time. He does it in two areas, as I just told you. The first, in terms of assurance. The second, in terms of his doctrine of sin. Uh, greater clarity in, in expressing the doctrine of sin, expressing it theologically in terms of guilt, 
power, and being. Okay? But we'll talk about that later. Um, well, so John Wesley has undergone this evangelical conversion. Um, and he gave evidence of this newfound faith when he delivered what Albert Outler, uh, the, the great Wesley scholar, uh, called his evangelical manifesto, which he delivered before St. Mary's. St. Mary's is the church in Oxford. He delivered it in St. Mary's on his, and the title of his sermon was Salvation by Faith salvation by faith, and it took Ephesians 2.8 as its text, uh, by grace are ye saved through faith. Um, and in that sermon, Wesley considers, he considers three key questions. The first question is what faith it is through which we are saved. Notice that first question. Uh, what faith it is through which we are saved. Because we should know in this course already, do we not, that not all faith, not all faith is saving faith, okay? Uh, faith generally in God, not specifically focused on Jesus Christ, is not saving faith, okay? For example, uh, and so Wesley is going to raise in this sermon, Salvation by Faith, this first question, what faith it is through which we are saved, okay? Um, and that, of course, is an important question. And what is Wesley going to say? Notice, because this is reflective of his theological journey up to this point, and it makes sense of the prior theological journey. Because he says this, saving faith is not only an assent, and we talked about faith as a census, it's not only an assent to the whole gospel of Christ, but a full reliance, a full reliance on the blood of Christ, a trust in the merits of his life, death, and resurrection a recumbency upon him as our atonement and our life, as given for us and living in us. And then he raises the second question. What is the salvation which is through faith? See, that's an important question for us, I think. I think this is very important for us today. You know, to ask the question, what is salvation? Because I know in the, in the context, in the ecclesiastical context in which I move, people define salvation differently. They define it very differently. And they don't define it in the way in accordance with Scripture. They don't. They don't. And so we need to be aware of that. We need to be aware of that, that even in the church today, People are talking about salvation, but they don't mean the greatest story that's ever been told or ever could be told because some other narrative has displaced the gospel, much like carbon monoxide can displace oxygen in the blood and the patient dies. You understand what I'm saying? So it's important to raise this question, what is salvation? We have to ask the basic question in the church. They're important. And of this question, Wesley writes, it is a present, present salvation, that it entails nothing less than redemption from sin here and now, here and now. In other words, redemption is not simply something that is future, you know, but it is something that is present. It is something present, something that happens now. We are redeemed today. Uh, and Wesley writes, quote, through faith that is in him, meaning Christ, they are saved both from the guilt and from the power of it. Okay, And so uh, Wesley uh, elaborates here. He elaborates here. This then is the salvation which is through faith, even in the present world. A salvation from sin 
and the consequences of sin, both often expressed in the word justification, which taken in the largest sense implies a deliverance from guilt and punishment by the atonement of Christ actually applied to the soul of the sinner now believing on him and a deliverance from the power of sin through Christ formed in his heart so that he who is thus justified or saved is indeed born again. Okay, watch this. Watch this now for another misunderstanding out there in Wesley Studies land today. There are people out there in Wesley Studies who argue that John Wesley taught you could be justified in the Christian sense. I grant you there are a number of ways of understanding of justification. I mean, there's the sense that Christ died for the sins of the whole world. There's the sense that uh, all people have already been forgiven by God because of what Christ has done. But that, that, for, that forgiveness has to be received. And that's what we mean by justification in the Christian sense. We mean that though Christ died for the sins of the whole world, you know, we must say like, like John Wesley that Christ died for me, even me. Christ died for Ken Collins, even Ken Collins. Yes. And you put your name there. You put your name in there. Okay. And that's what we mean by justification uh, in, in the Christian sense. In the Christian sense. Um, and for Wesley, if you're justified, you're born of God. If you're born of God, you're justified. There are people out there saying that you can be justified in the Christian sense and not be born of God. Think about that for a moment. Just think about that for a moment. Could I be free from the guilt of sin for very long if my nature has not been transformed in the new birth? I don't think so. As a matter of fact, I think if I am not born of God, if I have not received this power of the Holy Spirit in my life, the freedom from the power and dominion of sin that Wesley repeatedly writes about, I will probably pretty quickly be committing the same sins for which I just asked forgiveness for. Okay, without a transformation of nature, I'm going to be committing the very same sins, you know, again and again. Just like John Wesley was doing in Georgia. And so it is, it is impossible. Yes, we must say that. It is impossible uh, to be justified, to enjoy the freedom from the guilt of sin without also being born of God. Transformed in nature so that we are empowered and we are free from the power and dominion of sin and we walk in a new way. We walk in the way of holy love. We walk in the way of holiness. And for John Wesley, oh, I can cite chapter and verse. I can bring them out. Wesley says this is conjoined. It's a conjoined that to be justified is to be born of God. To be born of God is to be justified. We cannot separate them. We cannot separate them. They come together. Now, they come simultaneously in our lives, though we can distinguish them logically. In other words, uh, we tend to think of being forgiven first before we're empowered. And that's fine. Wesley says we can distinguish these works logically. We tend to think of forgiveness, the reception of forgiveness first, and then we're empowered. But these works ever come conjoined. They come simultaneously, not one without the other. You cannot be justified in the Christian sense, certainly not very long, without also being born of God. Uh, the two ever. Look at it this way, and, and it makes perfect theological sense. The, the God who is merciful enough to forgive us our sins is good enough to transform our nature, okay? 
the two go together. All right, let's let's entertain uh, some questions here. Yes. I, I didn't get to the third one yet. Ah, that's why. <laughs> didn't get there yet. Yes. Yeah, they, they said, uh, don't come in these pulpits anymore. We don't like what you're preaching. So they didn't accept him to preach, but did he ever have the persecution for his beliefs? beliefs or... <laughs> oh, yes. John Wesley was persecuted uh, by, by many, uh, both in the church and outside the church. Uh, there were clergymen, Anglican clergymen, who did not like Methodism at all. Uh, and they were ongoingly critical of the Wesleys, engaged in ongoing evil speaking. Uh, Wesley saw this issue as so, so important that he wrote a separate sermon, a separate sermon on the cure of evil speaking uh, because it's sinful um, uh, and it's not loving our neighbor as we should. And Wesley was, un, in, many, in, in many instances, unfairly criticized. Uh, by those in the church and also those beyond the church. And Wesley encountered mobs, mobs of people uh, who would be inspired by others to rail against the Methodists. Uh, uh, there would be physical violence against them at times. Um, uh, at times, uh, Wesley should have been fearing for his life, uh, though he had calm in the midst of the mob. Uh, uh, so there were those kinds of things going on as well. Uh, the Wesleys were criticized by bishops, Anglican bishops. Uh, they were not encouraged. They were discouraged. Uh, so yes, in a number of ways, uh, and we could cite numerous instances, actually, John Wesley uh, was suffering. But that's par for the course. <laughs> because we already know, because Jesus told us, that if we are faithful, if we are a disciple of Jesus Christ, we will, we will suffer. You know, if they, if they persecuted Christ the Master, they will persecute us. Jesus already told us that. And so uh, suffering uh, is a thing that we have to expect in being faithful to Jesus Christ. Uh, that the fact that we are and continue to walk in the light, uh, that will invite ongoing criticism, persecution, and I'm sure you can think of many instances where this happens even today. Yeah. Yes. Благодаря, ну, как бы, наследию, можно сказать, Лютера, там, Джона Уэсли, ну, для нас сейчас, вот, в наших церквях, ну, в основном, это, это основная идея, которую, ну, все проповедуют и все слышат, в основном в самом начале э, о том, что мы спасаемся благодатью через веру. Good. Yeah, but, uh, no, no, у меня вопрос. Uh, ну как бы что он дальше делал он же не перестал на этом грешить вообще и с тех пор никогда не грешил у меня вопрос как он дальше относился к тому что э, ну он все равно согрешал когда-то Yeah, I mean, you're basically asking the question now in terms of regeneration, which is in respect to freedom from the power and dominion of sin. Uh, and you have some views about that already uh, before you have heard all of what Wesley has to teach in this area. Um, we will present that material and let it progress naturally. Um, in light of your question, I think on, in some respects you misunderstand what Wesley is going to teach because 
you don't have enough material to work with because I haven't given you uh, and filled it out in great detail what this means in terms of freedom from the power and dominion of sin with respect to the new birth. We are going to fill that out, uh, but I want to wait. I want to wait uh, until we get to the theological part of the course, but we will answer your question. Uh, I want it to develop naturally in the flow of the course. So thank you. Thank you very much for your, for your question. Uh, other questions, comments? Yes, in the back. Yeah, the three elements that we were talking about earlier relates to conversion. Conversion. So conversion has three parts. Justification, which is the first, forgiveness of sins. Second, the new birth, which is regeneration. Okay. Then thirdly, we mentioned assurance, the direct witness of the Holy Spirit with our spirit. So it's not regeneration that has three parts. It's conversion that has three aspects, three aspects. Um, and the three aspects that make up conversion include justification, regeneration, and assurance. Yes. Yeah. OK, other, other questions? We have time for one more. Well, I missed that. What? Who are oh, who are the Moravians? Yes, that's a good question. Um, the Moravians uh, historically uh, go back um, uh, even before the time of the Reformation in the 16th century. Um, the United, the, the their uh, United Brethren, these this group, and it goes back and it has connections. Um, prior to the Reformation. So I, I hear from time to time some people referring to the Unitas Fratrum, you know, uh, another name uh, to refer to the Moravians, uh, the United Brethren, as, um, you know, uh, the first Protestants or something like that, um, which may not theologically be technically accurate, but they are a group that go back, uh, you know, far prior to Methodists, the Methodists for sure, uh, and they have a very important um, uh, theological heritage, uh, uh, and there is some connection uh, with them uh, in terms of Jan Hus, um, the Czech uh, preacher, uh, the Czech preacher, uh, and the followers of Jan Hus, and Jan Hus, uh, was executed uh, at the Council of Constance in 1415. So you see how far back this goes, uh, prior to the time of the Reformation. Jan Hus, although, although he was promised safe passage, they said you could come to the Council of Constance and no, no harm will come to you. And then at the Council of Constance, they executed him. You ask yourself the question, well, how'd that happen? Uh, they said, we don't have to keep faith with heretics. Uh, and so they broke their word. And by the way, by the way, John Wesley knew about all that and took that uh, as a very, very negative thing, uh, that you broke your word, a very negative thing. But at any rate, coming from the followers of Jan Hus were the Taborites and the Utrechtists. These are two movements that, that come out of the Hussites, you know, Jan Hus, and it's from, out of that, the followers of Jan Hus that come the Moravians. So you see that they could trace their origins back to the 15th century prior to the time of the Reformation. Now, 
the Moravians were very influenced by Luther and, and the Reformation in the 16th century. And that's what they're passing along to John Wesley, especially Peter Berler, as I, as I taught earlier. So, good question.